Hi everyone, welcome back. I thought I'd try something a little different this week and for your Tuesday viewings I would try and see what was new in tech for the week ahead or the week past or whatever comes up. I don't actually know but we'll see how we get on. So to begin with this first debut episode we're going to start with space, fitness and then I guess more fitness? in the way of tech. The first one is the Mars landing. NASA has now put another rover onto Mars. NASA's Mars Perseverance has successfully descended onto Mars surface on the 18th of February, 2021. Initially, it was launched 30th of July, 2020. So it's been what, six, seven months it's taken to go from planet to planet, which to me is actually quite surprising because it takes a, a month or two to get up to the moon traditionally so that's actually fairly quick a few quick things i want to run through about the this new perseverance rover there's a couple of things first one there is an excellent map on the nasa website i'll put a link in the description but basically it shows roughly where on mars the per the rover is located at any one time which is awesome and it also gives you, like Google Maps, it gives you names and locations of all the places nearby. So it's actually a Google Maps for Mars, which is also a very cool thing to take 10 minutes to have a look at. The new rover primarily has four main primary objectives for the upcoming year. Broken down into habitability, two is seeking biosignatures, three is caching rocks and soil samples, and fourth is to see whether to test the atmosphere for upcoming human arrival. So this is actually the first time a rover's been there deliberately to start leading the way for us going ourselves. Before it was just to investigate and track, now we're actually putting in the groundwork to look into taking humans over to there. So this rover comes with a wide range of really cool tech, enough data to really fully accomplish all these factors within a very limited period of time. I mean, a year is not a lot of time in the grand scheme of things when it comes to space. So the first one is looking for habitability. Now this, this is obviously just identifying environments that previously could have potentially contained water, which could have potentially had microbial life living on it or in it at some point. So the rover itself has a camera and two are spectrometers. Now these will be used to try and identify all these areas, almost kind of like archeology span really at this point, to identify potential areas that could have potentially been vast pools of water, whether they could have been the equivalent of lagoons, or if you're in Scotland, lochs, or any sort of river samples, uh, anywhere where they could have potentially been these dense and divots that would have been uh, ideal for microbial life. Now, the other good thing is by identifying these areas, if we ever looked at something in the future like terraforming the planet or anything similar where we start to make the planet a bit more habitable, is these are the types of locations we would want to start building bases because as we start to get the planet kind of flushing similar to our own planet, these will be the areas that w are most likely to first start collecting pools of water, which we obviously need to survive. Number two is the seeking biosignatures. Now, this is, this is a bit like the earlier example, but they're basically looking for any proof that there may have been microbial life at some point. Even if it's not there today, any sort of proof it was there is technically proof there were Martians because although we're not thinking of it in the sense as something as tangible as you or me, we're looking at microscopic life forms that have that have lived and died on the red surface. And that basically just makes them Martians. Third one is caching rock and soil samples. This is kind of on its own as it goes through from area to area. You want to trace as track as much through so that when it's hopefully brought back or we go there, we can start testing it. We can actually start to see uh, from the different regions and areas what the environment was like and ideally what would be most suited for ourselves when 
we go there. I mean, no one else is using it, so we might as well see what's most ideal for ourselves. And lastly is preparing for humans. So this rover has, it's called a MOXIE. It produces oxygen from the atmosphere on the planet, also known as a, basically just a big a system that takes in the current atmosphere, flushes, separates, filters it, and tries to produce oxygen. Now this is obviously our immediate thing we need to figure out before traveling there ourselves because if we're there without oxygen, it doesn't matter if we have all the food in the world, all the water in the world, if we don't have oxygen, Blacks that comes from water, but if we don't have a way to recycle it and keep it flushing so we have air to breathe, there's no point in going at all. So that's everything for the for that for the moment. I mean, it's literally just landed. It's not done very much yet. So we'll need to wait to see what the results are out of that. No, well, item number two, we're now into sportswear now. So then there's two more items, one sportswear and one sporting item. So we'll see how we get on. The first one is Under Armour have brought out a new trainer called the Velocity Wind. Now this is supposed to be, I'm not sure how they're trying to market this shoe. It seems to be more of an all-rounder. They've been testing it between runners and basketball players. Uh, obviously runners for the kind of usage and the consistent impact over time, especially longer, longer distance runners. And then they've been testing it with basketball players for it, its grip to any surface, which is obviously primarily what bas basketball players need. Now, why is this notable? So Under Armour are in their final testing period of basically removing the rubber outsole of a shoe, basically creating an all-in-one compound material that will be the base of the shoe that provides both the cushioning, the grip, and the stability that you need in your shoes in order to uh, carry out whatever sport or physical activity you're exerting yourself in. Now, the beauty behind this is if you're, what makes this noticeable is that if you're cutting off a separate, an individual section of the shoe, it means you've got less components that need to intertwine together in order to make a functioning shoe, which means overall in the long run, they're more likely to come out more efficient and overall a better standard of quality. Bear in mind, they make millions of these shoes every single day. So the more consistency you can get, the, the less components that go into a shoe, the more consistency you're going to have. So this is kind of the breakthrough here. It's, n it's not necessarily anything new, but it's up until now, a lot of the compounds have just never been able to beat rubber. They've either been too solid, causing obviously pains on the feet, almost like running barefooted on concrete, or they've been too soft and they just, they just fall apart once they start to heat up. So this is Under Armour's claim that they have now found a way to actually improve on the traditional rubber sole and this is how they're innovating now. So it'll be interesting to see whether these do legitimately work and also whether they're kind of useful for like the everyday person. So at the moment, I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure how they're marketing it. So if it's for elite runners or at least elite basketball players, it doesn't seem to be very specific. They seem to be just trying to market everyone and see what sticks at the moment. But in terms of it coming down the chain to the rest of us who maybe are weekend runners or just go out every now and again or you know are only in the gym an hour every couple of days how does that actually impact us okay it's got the comfort okay you've got the stability and you don't have the issues that come with having more layers in a shoe but for the majority of us who are only using it very lightly how much will that actually affect the rest of us but there's only one way to find out. And the last item we're gonna have a quick look at right now is the Proform Fitness Mirror. Now Proform, it's not really a company I've seen before or heard of before, but to me, they seem a lot like Peloton in terms of they work with iFit and you pay a subscription service and they give you videos and live footage of workouts going on, whether it's you know spin classes, fitness classes, uh, pump classes, all these different things. You pay a monthly subscription and you get access to all these live classes. Now, 
the Proform have brought out a budget treadmill and spin bike, which isn't anything new. I mean, it's good because obviously you want to save on the money, but the interesting one is their smart mirror or their fitness mirror as they're calling it. So basically this mirror acts a lot like a Peloton. It's basically just a massive T, essentially just a massive TV that looks like a, a smartphone that plays vid live footage of any sort of workout or exercise class that you're there to join. On the back of the mirror is a set of weights and dumbbells uh, that you can use throughout the class. And the interesting thing is that it's not just showing you the video, but because obviously it's a mirror, uh, you can watch yourself and your own posture behind the person you're viewing. So it's got an aspect there that is quite interesting because obviously a lot of the time we're not focusing too much on our form. That's where a whole industry of physiotherapy is basically just gone through the roof because you've got all the weekend warriors who don't stretch, stay hunched over all day and then perform badly in a fitness class and then end up hemorrhaging a disc or something. So at least this way you could see your, your posture a bit more. Hopefully, fingers crossed, reduce injuries. But apart from that, it is, there's, not, there's not too much interesting about it. It's essentially just a large smartphone at the end of the day. It, the speakers are Bluetooth compatible. The mirror itself is a touchscreen and HD ready. It's obviously you can connect it to things. I think you can connect it to things like YouTube and stuff. So even if you're not paying for the classes, I guess you could subscribe to some uh, fitness YouTubers and then just play their classes live from there. The size of the screen in terms of what you would look at is 22, 24 inch by 60 inch. So it's quite long. Uh, but apart from that, there's not too much else to it. I mean, it's kind of cool because you're looking at live footage within a mirror. But at the end of the day, if you had it on your TV, for instance, the only difference is you wouldn't be able to see yourself. But if you're absolutely getting the most out of a workout where you're gasping for air and just trying to hold on, would you really be spending the time staring at yourself, being vain, making sure you're looking good? I don't know personal preference but I mean for the price of it that you're looking at you're looking at about $1,500 is I'd rather just use the TV I've already got but that's me personally so that's a quick snapshot of everything tech at the moment I'll see you next week <laughs>